So I went coffin shopping in Ghana. And if you go, if you're not into the whole pine box motif, Ghana's the place to go. <laughs> you, you want to be buried in a giant beer bottle? That's not a problem. <laughs> want to go through the afterlife proclaiming your undying devotion to the oil industry? It's a little weird, but you could do that. How about be buried in a fish, in a cow, in a pineapple, in a sort of chocolate eclair-looking thing? <laughs> They've got it right on the showroom floor. And here, of course, is the one I picked, the traveler's coffin. And, um, you know, maybe I'm being presumptuous because this is obviously the good traveler's coffin. Bad travelers going to hell get a middle seat in coach. I was in Ghana as part of this tour that was billed as the West Africa you must see before you die. Check off your bucket list. And we were doing really cool things. Uh, we went to Timbuktu, which means for the rest of my life, I can casually say, when I was in Timbuktu. <laughs> we, we went to Victoria Falls, which is unbelievable. The force of all this water falling off the edge of the world is so loud that even from a mile away, when I got cornered by an enraged monkey and started to yell for help, not a single one of the zebra looked up. <laughs> and we went out into the sand dunes of Namibia at night, where there were more stars than I've ever seen anywhere in my life. But they were southern hemisphere stars, so I didn't know them. I didn't recognize any of the patterns in the sky. And I had this weird moment of transposition of thinking, maybe I'm the one on a different planet, and maybe one of those little blinking lights is everything I love. And in Ghana, our hotel was right on the beach, but in the morning when we loaded out, I discovered that not a single one of the people I was with not a single one of these people spending vast sums of time and money to see the world they had to see before they died had so much and gone as stuck a toe in the ocean. Not a one of them had gone down and stood into the Bight of Benin, which was really surprisingly cool, I thought, when I was washing the coffin sawdust off my feet. But, you know, it just wasn't on their bucket list. And Somehow, it has all become about the bucket list. Books you must read, movies you must see, music you must hear, these great imperatives of all these things you must check off, because art and beauty are things that you could say, did it. And nowhere has this taken over as much as it has in travel. You don't go on a vacation anymore. You don't just go to Spain and drink sangria. You go to Spain and hike the Camino, and you don't go to Paris and watch the boulevards, you go eat in every three-star Michelin restaurant. And if you don't do these things, if you ignore these imperatives of things you must do before you die, obviously your life's meaningless. <laughs> so, you've, so you've got to carpe that diem, you've got to be checking off that bucket list like you're Santa Claus on a cocaine bender. <laughs> because just like the naked teenagers in the horror movie, you are going to die. And the question is not if, but when. But I started to think, I don't, I'm not good at doing what I'm told to. I don't want to have to do things. What if, instead of thinking I had to do something before I die, what if I just did something while I was alive? <laughs> what, if, what if I just... <sighs> what if I just did something because it was... because the day is there and you can? What if I just did it because it's fun? Because this... is more or less what a year left to live sounds like. The doctors would not let me record my own heart, so I found this one online. <laughs> um, 
under the title, Sounds Associated with Sudden Death, which is just this really fun thing to have come up on your iPod shuffle. And you can just hear in the back of your head that, that Dick Clark voice of saying, it's got a crappy beat and you absolutely cannot dance to it. But the first time I was told I had less than a year to live was about 15 years ago. And <laughs> Since then, I've been told five more times. Once every couple of years, the medical profession gets together and says, hey, you, out of the pool, time's up. <laughs> and, as you've already guessed, spoiler alert! <laughs> now, if, if we put aside the possibility that somehow I am as indestructible and immortal as Keith Richards, <laughs> what, what we're left with is that because of my refusal to die on cue, <laughs> so far, I have consciously lived the last year of my life six times. Most people do this once or not at all, and they get it over with. But, but I've done it again and again and again. And sometimes I've done it really well. I've been to more than 50 countries since I was told to stop traveling. I've met kings and shaman, and I've fallen in love, and I've fallen back in love, and I have been pecked by penguins. <laughs> and... Of course, sometimes I do the whole dying thing very badly. Somebody once posted on Facebook, I'm going to live every day like it's my last. And my little sister just blasted them. She was, yeah, well, my brother just found out this really might be his last day, and he's decided he's going to spend it taking painkillers and eating cookies. Yeah, hobnobs and Vicodin, the breakfast of people who are just too tired to care if they're champions. <laughs> so, now is really when I wish I could say something uplifting. <laughs> and there, there are people who can do that, you know? There are people who come through this storm or their version of this storm and they find some measure of hope or enlightenment and death makes them bigger. I missed that bus. <laughs> uh, as best I can tell, dying sucks. It's painful and it's humiliating and every day you wake up and there's another little piece of you missing and some, no matter how empty the tanks are, somehow you have to find a way to compensate for this, to find a way to still be who you are. And even worse than that is that the dying makes you see pain in the faces of the people you love. And you can't save them from that pain because it's the pain of them wanting to save you. So... You know, maybe, maybe you can get an epiphany or two out of it. Um, but it seems to me like a really expensive way to hit these epiphanies. I, as far as I can see, dying is absolutely nothing to live for. <laughs> it's just nothing to live for. Which is why this whole bucket list idea freaks me out so much. Why on earth is everybody so excited about writing lists, a to-do list, that invariably the last thing on it is die? No, no, I'm, I, I just couldn't do that. It was just, I, I had enough lists from doctors already, and I'm not going to write, I'm not going to write my own list that says die, so I just thought, <laughs> screw it. I'm going to go find some peace and quiet, which brings us here, to Haleakala. Mm -hmm. 
If you go looking for peace and quiet, you very quickly find out there isn't any. Humans are the species that make noise, and we are just ever better and better at it. Your car stereo is probably more powerful than the amps the Beatles had when they played Shea Stadium. Noise is so much a part of the fabric of our daily lives that if you get a person from North America into a relaxed state and ask them to hum a note, the note they are overwhelmingly likely to hum is a B natural, which is the same note as the electricity in the wires everywhere around us. And of course, we make all this noise for the very simple reason, as anybody who has ever tried to meditate will tell you, it's worse in here. It's much, much worse in here. It's so loud in here. All those lists of the things that you should do but haven't and shouldn't do but have and who you should be but aren't, the, the endless pounding of desires. And I thought, I've just got to... I'm going to get very far away from all this. So I went up to the Arctic, where I camped with the, the locals and listened to the, the hard click of her, caribou hooves on migration. And I went to Mongolia, where I was kayaking on a lake up near the Russian border, and the ice was just breaking up for the spring, and there was this amazing delicate wind chime sound in the crackles. And out in the Marshall Islands, I was on this tiny little atoll uh, when a storm hit, a storm hit at night. And as I was listening to it, I realized I can hear a difference in the waves in the lagoon and the waves in the ocean. They're making different sounds. And so I ran outside, pouring rain, palm trees thrashing around, coconuts dropping like cannonballs. And I'm standing there, and I'm moving back and forth, and I'm listening to this duet of lagoon and ocean, and the world is singing just for me. And then I got sick. Which is nothing unusual. I am always, at some degree, sick. But this was somebody's cut the elevator cables free fall sick. I was briefly poured into a wheelchair. I spent about six months passing out every time I did something dramatic like stand up. And I found out that, if I'm understanding this correctly, it's possible to dehydrate your eyeballs which makes the entire world look as if you're walking through a room of slightly deflated party balloons. And so, in this state, of course I'm going to book a ticket to go to Hawaii, climb down a volcano. And I figured there was about an 80% chance I'd die, to be honest. When I told my doctor, he just went, I'm out, I'm done, I'm out. When I left home, my will was neatly centered on my desk, where it'd be easy to find. But, you know, I was, I was okay with the risk, because first, I knew eventually my friends will love telling this story. What happened to Edward? He threw himself into a volcano and died. <laughs> and second, because as the poet Frank O'Hara said, we fight for what we love not what we are. You don't need to fight for death. That's nothing to love for. It's much, much better to fight to be alive. The bottom of Haleakala, Haleakala might be the quietest place on Earth. People who research these things are not entirely sure, because when they went to measure it, the microphones, it was so quiet, the microphones picked up the sound of their own metal fatigue, which made getting an accurate reading impossible. <laughs> So, I started hiking right after sunrise. It took me about seven hours to get down. I don't know how many times I fell. I don't know how many times I just sat down and said, okay, gonna die here. There was, I don't know, maybe an hour where I was either sleepwalking or hallucinating. I don't know which it was. But, but I did get there. I got to the point that the Park Service does not want to identify too closely as the quietest place on Earth. And I collapsed. And so I had no choice but to listen. 
And I listened until my head stopped screaming, you're gonna die in a volcano. And I listened until my head stopped saying, you're gonna die in a volcano, that's kind of cool. And I had been told that if it's a really quiet day down there, you'll not exactly hear but be aware of a pulse, which is actually the waves hitting the island miles and miles off. And I did hear something. It actually sounded kind of like that. It sounded like the world saying, eh, your heart's still beating, you're not dead yet. It sounded like the world saying, let's go outside and play. So when I got out of the volcano, I felt better than I had in years, and I completely changed the way I traveled. Instead of saying, I want to see, I said, I wonder. And I would go places with no idea what I was going to find. I'd just show up to see what was going to happen. I wonder what memory smells like. And I ended up in the perfume fields of France. I wonder why two people standing right next to each other can see such entirely different things. And I went to a bunch of haunted houses in England to, to try and find a ghost. Because you, you, you put, your bucket list puts these expectations. You, you already know before you get there what it's going to be like. But how often is it really like that? A friend and I did the great romantic trip to Venice. And we drank Bellinis by the Grand Canal, and we went for gondola rides, and we slept in palaces, and we kissed at the top of bridges to protect each other from trolls. And <laughs> it, it was OK. We had a nice time. Uh, but you know, really, I mean, I look at my life. The, thing, the two most important things I can think of, the two things without which I would not be me, happened in a high school library and a hotel hallway. And how would I have ever known to want these things? How could I have ever put them on a list and say, these are the things that I must do before I die? You have to be there for the surprise. So after Venice, we had a couple of days left of vacation. And we just asked the hotel concierge what we should do. And he went, made a phone call, wrote out his quick note of directions, and said, here, you're really going to enjoy this. Which is how we ended up at the entirely miraculous little town of Oslo. It's only about an hour outside of Venice, but it's a different world. It's all cobblestones and window boxes. And despite all the leaves you see there, there's really more birds in those trees, and every one of them is singing. And I went into the food shop and asked the proprietor if the jar of honey was from Oslo, which in my fluent Italian meant going, Oslo? <laughs> and the man's face just lit up. I said, Oslo! <laughs> and, and I looked at him more closely, and he had these throat, these ear-to-ear -ear scars of who knows how many throat surgeries. But now he was really excited because he could sell us an Oslo picnic. And he ran around the store and he grabbed bread, Oslo, and figs, Oslo, and olives, Oslo, and this really amazing blue-veined cheese that you could smell clear across the room, Oslo. And when I pointed at another cheese that I wanted, he said, no Oslo. <laughs> and he wouldn't sell it to us. And, yeah, of course, that was the greatest lunch of my life. And in that, in that, in that utter surprise, in, in something we never could have put on a bucket list, because 24 hours before, we had never heard of this town. My friend and I found everything that we had been hoping for from the trip and everything that we had hope, been hoping to be for each other on the trip. Your bucket list is about you. It's, it's you trying to stop time. Live every day like it's your last. Check off the bucket list. And what you're really doing is trying to make your life into like this little collection of snow globes. 
and say, here, this, 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 these are the things that really matter to me. <laughs> but if you just live because you're alive, then you're actually in the river of time and you're telling a story. And if you don't think that difference matters, lists a story, try it on a little kid. The princess went to the store and she bought butter and milk and eggs and sugar and see how long you can hold their attention. Now compare that to the guy in Oslo who didn't sell us a grocery list. He sold us the story of the place he loved. He sold us the story of the passion that had healed his scars. The great thing about stories is that you share, they're, they only work if you share them. And so you can take these stories of all the wonders the world has held and you can curl up around the people you love and you can say, once upon a time, doctors told me all these horrible things that were going to happen. But here's what I did instead. Here's what I did instead of what they expected me to do. Because I, I can tell you, you know, I've never been over the edge, but I've been right up to it a number of times. And the view from there, you don't care that you ran with the bulls or swam with sharks. You, you care that you had never been too much of a coward to say I love you when it needed to be said. You care that you said thank you way more often than you said please. Your bucket list is a please. Dear world, please give me these things. I promise I'm gonna make them matter. But if you ignore the bucket list, if you just live to be alive, you'll find out that there's no reason to go shopping for coffins one minute early you'll find out that instead of trying to drop things in your bucket list, you'll find that the world is just pouring things into it. Everything is coming into it, and it's just overflowing. And so that all you really have to do when the time finally does come is let go of it and say thank you.